I owe these chambers to a patron. My art ought to earn me his favor. I want to take London by storm. The city shall be my stage. I must play my hand banking all I have. Only then is applause assured. Bravo, William, bravo! You already have my applause. You can worry about posthumous fame later. For today, make do with this small room. Let London await you. The game played there is more their own making. Many thanks, my lord, for your compliment and these chambers. Your visit here is a great honor. You alone turned the room into a salon. I left the lordship outside the door. I am here, like-minded, nothing more. Tis for the theater that I shall live, which is why even this awful rhyme you must forgive. Then feel forgiven, man of like mind. I call him friend, and put the clichés to rest. What brings you here? My curiosity. How far has your work flourished? It's... it's moving along. I'm gathering stones, but they're not worthy to build a house with. Because you aspire to a palace and not a cottage. My friend, you encourage me far more with your words than with all the other gifts. I would only be too glad to give you something in return, but the peace, it needs more time. Then you shall have it. But I do ask you for one thing. Read what you have written till now out loud to my daughter. She has a nose for stories and her inquisitiveness shall drive you onward. As you wish, my lord, though I have my doubts. I wish it, and shall dispel your doubts in a trace. And my dearest, please step in. Here I am, father. So quickly, you haven't been eavesdropping, have you? No, listening at the door is not good manners. But snatching up a few words through a crack in the doorway while walking by can occur from time to time, can't it? Be that as it may, I take great pleasure in introducing you to William Shakespeare. And you, William, to my one and only Anne. I am very pleased to make your acquaintance, Master Shakespeare. The, uh, the pleasure is all mine, my lady. What is the name of the tale that you're supposed to tell me? Uh, the story is called, um, it's called Veronese Romance. It, it sounds like an Italian noodle speciality. It's the current working title. A start, William, a start. At which I, however, shall now have to leave you. Take heed of Anne and copious success in quenching the curiosity with which she tends to torment me. Where have I put? It's got to be somewhere here. Are you looking for the story, Master Shakespeare? Uh, what? No, 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 merely my notes for the beginning. Can't you get started without them? Oh, I got it start all right, many years ago. And where, pray tell? This story is set in far off Verona. There was once two houses, both alike in status and dignity, bonded by deep enmity. An ancient grudge, the weightiest burden on their future. New wounds slashed upon the sores of yore. Springing forth from star-crossed loins, a couple's love sated with tears, wept by the story's every listener, giving vent to their fears. Perk your ears, Miss Anne. I want to tell it to you. Off to Verona, the seat of the Montagues, to one of the two houses, where Romeo, its youngest scion, is awash in lovesick throes. The dispute is of no interest to him. All he can think of is Rosalind. A note intends to convince her of his love, and in turn, ignite her passion for him.
Have you already tried there? You might find something else there. Have you already tried there? Have you already tried there? find something else there. The words that had still burned within him a moment ago, now brought to paper, will Romeo quickly carry to Rosalind. A sudden encounter with Mercutio at the door. In friendly restraint, he offers himself as messenger in Romeo's stead. He vows to deliver the epistle if Romeo sneaks with him into the enemy's home.
A ball is to be held there, with many a fair damsel to forget the likes of Rosalind. Hosting the event are the veritable Capulets, whose house just now welcomes a guest of rank. Count Paris has come to speak with Capulet the Elder. When Juliet, his daughter, hears of the Count's visit from a trusted nurse, she is bent on snatching a look at him. But Count and Father converse in his drawing room, the doors locked and barred. find something else there. You'll find what you need there. Perhaps you'll find what you need there. Upon learning that the Count has asked her for her hand in marriage, Juliet begins to tremble, her knees turn weak. Just as she is about to go, her father's voice reaches her ears. He invites Count Paris to a masked ball that very evening. Mercutio and Romeo stand before the closely guarded Capulet gate. Each guest's identity is put to the test, even their masquerade is to no avail. Should the two find no other means of entry, this eve's festivity shall go on without them.
Have you already tried there? Have you already tried there? Have you already tried there? Take a look over there. Find what you need there. A door to the side becomes the ticket of admission, providing Mayor Cutio and Romeo with a prompt way in. Having donned their masks, they mingle with the other guests. Juliet is a twitter as the ball looms ever closer. For hours now she has sought a fitting costume. Garb to show her at her very best before all the other women attending. Like a magnet, Juliet wants the Count's eyes drawn to her.